Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi, and welcome to Self-Improvement Atlas, the personal science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm Marie Stella, your host from Melbourne, Australia. Let's start the show. Welcome back to Self-Improvement Atlas, the Personal Science Insights Podcast. Divorce is more commonplace and more commonly talked about these days, and that's not a bad thing at all. In fact, it can actually be a good thing. There's less pressure to remain in toxic relationships, but in some cultures, stigma still reigns strong, and that's what we'll be discussing in this episode with Divorce and Relationship Confidence Coach, Monica Kelra. Passionate about empowering women for successful relationships, Relationships, she coaches women to rise out of victimhood as relationship warriors, owning their power and healing from generational relationship patterns. Hi, Monica. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Betty, for having me. I'm honored to be here. It's such a pleasure talking to you and meeting you. Um, and I'm really curious to know in your line of work, what is the most common issue your clients come to you with? So basically, I am the founder of Rewards. So to divorce means to revive, to reclaim, and to reset emotionally. So my clients come to me in order to divorce. And that means that they either require more intimacy in their relationship or they're going through a divorce. And thus I assist them in reviving their confidence, reclaiming their inner power and resetting emotionally to thrive in their future relationships. And could you elaborate on some of the struggles that they go through in the midst of divorce? Oh, those struggles are immense. They are just immense. So if I begin with the idea that after they've had a divorce, they are on a roller coaster of emotions. Um, because, and that would vary because if there is a social stigma attached, or if it isn't even attached, they go through a roller coaster of emotions because on the one hand, not only has the relationship ended, um, it has also led to the termination of all our future dreams and aspirations that we had built with this person. And so they experience um, a grief cycle. And as we know that a grief cycle has five stages, so they might be in the denial mode initially, and this may be followed by anger, or it could be depression or bargaining, or then acceptance, which comes much later. So they might be experiencing intense emotions during this journey. Um, and on top of that, um, they could also be, and this leads to a lot of isolation, because that's the time when you don't want to interact with anyone. Even getting out of bed might be a problem. And so there is that deep um, sense of, um, you know, alienation as well, because you don't want to interact with anyone. Um, and yes, so um, there could be other aspects as well that they are experiencing. So there might be some financial challenges because all of a sudden they've come to terms with the idea that they find themselves being on a new footing of, you know, financial planning. Uh, there are there might be uh, co-parent co-parenting challenges. You know, all of a sudden you are with these two little kids that you know you thought you raised together, and now you have to raise them all by yourself. There is the problem of division of assets. There is issue about alimony. There is there are legal proceedings. There are court proceedings to be pursued. Uh, so all of these can come up with a lot of challenge on the person who's going through a divorce. 
For sure. And I imagine that having to deal with the cultural stigma must just add a lot more pressure and stress. Um, so I I'm really looking forward to discussing this with you later on in the interview. Um, but that's a great preface to our topic for today for now. But before we get further into detail, I'd love to get to know you better. This is Have You Met Monica? My first question for you is what is your favorite book at the moment? Um, I have so many books that are my favorite, but I think I will talk about the one that I very recently read. Um, I recently read uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And even though he talks about financial success, however, uh, his principles can be applicable to personal development as well as to uh, relationships as well, because he talks about how um, thoughts can create our destiny. And thoughts play such an important role in our relationships because they can either make your relationship or break your relationship. You know, you might be telling stories about why your husband or your partner hasn't smiled at you today or why he isn't contributing. On the other hand, those very same thoughts, if you have if you have a sense of gratitude or appreciation, that can make up your relationship. The other concept that he talks about is having masterminds. So especially people who are in abusive relationships and the toxic ones, they tend to isolate themselves. And it's about having that mastermind, having those group of supportive people who can support you in not only navigating through that toxic relationship, but even afterwards as well in order to heal you. So I I feel that his book was very, very relevant and it resonated with me. And if you had to persuade someone in an elevator to read this book, what would you say? Just go and get it and read it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll listen to you. Um, so as for movies, what have you been watching recently? That's an interesting question. Um, Marie, you might be surprised, but it's been a very, very long time, maybe over a decade that I haven't watched a movie. Wow. Well, I'm not, well, I'm not that surprised. I feel like a lot of people aren't movie watchers. So that's completely fair, you know, like some people don't read books, some people don't read, uh, watch movies. Um, but has there ever been a movie in your life where you, um, that you liked and you remembered and has a place in your heart at all? Um, I think I mentioned on my previous podcast, Sound of Music resonated with me. I loved that movie. Um, and in saying that, um, I don't watch movies primarily because there's a lot of screen time. I work with my cr clients virtually. And so I like to relax and refresh myself by going outdoors, by going out for a walk or, you know, engaging myself in outdoor activities. So that's how, that's my way of refreshing. Yeah. It's great to get a break from technology and from looking at screens all the time. Um, and it just rejuvenates you, I feel like. So I feel like you're on the right track. You don't have to watch movies at all. Um, is there anyone that you look up to in your personal or professional life? Yes, there are many people. I will never call them as being my role models. I don't like the idea of calling people as being my role models. However, there are people who've inspired me and there's so many of them. Katie Byron, um, Brené Brown, Sydney Banks, Esther Perel, Terry Real. There's so many, many of them uh, because they've helped me to discover who I am. And at the same time, I've learned to accept myself. And in saying that, and why I was mentioning about the idea of a role model is because when I am working with clients who have been in abusive relationships, they... Uh, they, I find them to be uh, in a dance with their partner where they lose their sense of self with their partner. And my work with them is to assist them to find who they are and accept themselves as whole and complete rather than put someone on a pedestal and then compare your self-worth with them. 
Absolutely. That's a great sentiment to have and to always remind yourself that, you know, you are your own person um, and to never like lose that. Or if you do try and bring that back, because we're all human, we might get into this, you know, I don't want to say that I'm not susceptible to it either, if that makes sense. Um, And lastly, is there a course that you've taken in your life that has inspired you to this day? Um, Larry, ever since I've been on my personal development journey, I think I've done thousands of courses. Um, this year alone, I've done five major courses, um, two by Landmarks, one, one or two by um, Joe Dispenza, and currently I'm enrolled in two more uh, of Ron Malhotra's courses. One of them is called the MBA of Success and the other one is Magnify You. And in saying that, why I do these courses is because, um, and it's not just me, but any coach or any person who's involved, you know, working with people therapeutically, they have to constantly upskill themselves so that they are able to provide the best of services. And the deeper they go in the work with themselves is the deeper they can take their clients. So yes, I firmly believe in doing courses. Yeah, for sure. Is there one that has stuck with you? Uh, I am really inspired by uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza because he believes in creating your own reality. And uh, yes, I, I really like and admire his work. Yeah. What did you, what are the key takeaways that you took from that course? Um, there are so many of them. It's about overcoming your limiting beliefs. It's about um, elevating yourself from your limited emotions and then you know through his meditations working towards elevated emotions because he talks a lot about pineal medi- meditation um, and at the same time um, he believes a lot in manifestations and he talks about how we can create our own reality by visualizing it and at the same time not just visualizing but also emotionalizing uh, what we aspire to have or, or, um, or aspire to manifest. I. I'm a firm believer in his work. That sounds transformative for sure. And I'm really glad to hear that that cause had such an impact on you. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I feel like we got to know you a bit better. So now we'll move on to the interview section. And my first question for you is something that we like to ask all of our guests. Um, it can differ from person to person. So I'm really curious to know what your definition of personal development is. Well, that's an interesting question because um, I feel that personal development or some people also refer to it as um, self-development or self-help and it is a conscious pursuit of uh, personal, professional, um, emotional capacities and it encompasses a lot of things. So for some people, it just might mean self-awareness, where you're getting aware of your own needs, your own thoughts, your values, your aspirations. For the others, it might mean goal setting. So you're setting clear, realistic goals for yourself, both in personal and professional life. For yet others, it might mean emotional awareness, where you are understanding your emotions, you're managing your emotions and you're expressing your emotions. There might be yet some other people who... Uh, believe that it's a skill development. So you are not only redefining and upskilling your skills that you already know, but at the same time, you're learning new skills. It, it The list just goes on because there are others who might feel it, it's all about, uh, it, it's all about that mindset cultivation. As I just mentioned about Joe Dispenza, you're overcoming your limiting beliefs. You're, oh, you are, you are rewiring your mindset in order to achieve your goals. And then there are others who believe that it's all about health and well-being. So they are into exercise and they are into having nutritional food. And then there are also another set of people who believe in improving their relationships, in you know developing that effective communication, in being able to uh, resolve their conflicts uh, constructively. So it's a holistic approach. Uh, if one is um, into one type that I've just mentioned, there are so many others because um, that holistic approach leads to a more fulfilling um, being as you are. So that's what I would define personal development to be. 
that's a great explanation of what your your definition of um, personal development is. But I'm also curious to know what is your definition of intimate relationships? How do you think it ties in to personal development? Um, so basically, intimate relationship is when there is um, an intimate or a physical, emotional, psychological connection with another person. Um, it is that close, personal, private connection that you develop with somebody. Uh, for some people, they might think that it is only related to physical intimacy or, you know, a sexual expression in a romantic relationship. But it goes much deeper uh, because it also involves emotional connections wherein you are able to be that launching pad and safe harbor for your partner. Where you are um, you are there for each other both during times that are enjoyable but also during the challenging times. It takes into consideration trust so that you are able to express yourself vulnerably uh, and that it is not judged. So you are held in that safe space and a non-judgmental space. Um, it also takes into consideration communication, that you're able to communicate openly to the other person and express your needs and set your boundaries with them um, and have that, you know, the, you're involved in active listening so that you are listening to uh, understand rather than listen to respond. Uh, it definitely includes physical intimacy, physical connection, that sexual e expression that a physical touch plays an important role in a relationship. And on top of that, there are people who believe in even shared values and goals. However, um, and people believe that, oh, my values with the, uh, my partner do not match, so I don't need to stay in that relationship. However, I have seen with my clients that even though they might have differing goals um, uh, and values, yet they can be very good partners because it all comes down to our communication. If you're able to communicate your values and your goals to the other person and understand and accept the other person where they are, and then in that way you respect each other, irrespective and have a good relationship, irrespective of differing um, goals or values. Um, you connected the question to another aspect as well as to how intimate relationships are related with personal development. So you had two connections, two questions there. And I would like to proceed with that part of the question now. Um, when we are talking about intimate relationship and personal development, intimate relationship serve as a catalyst for personal development. And the first thing where it comes about is self-awareness. So, uh, whenever we are manifesting a partner or if we have a partner, it is a reason on why they are in our life because they hold mirrors for us where in that mirror, not only do we see our own strengths, but also our vulnerabilities, our weaknesses and areas of growth. So when we have, and as I said, that when we manifest somebody, they have come for a reason in our life because there are certain parts in ourselves which need to be healed. And they are there to put that in front of us for us to tend to our own inner landscape so that we can work on that aspect within ourselves. Um, this intimate uh, relationship and the relationship with personal development is concerned. There's definitely emotional intelligence here. Because when we are in a relationship, it is important to be to be mindful of our own emotions. Uh, and I'll give you that through an example. So if there's been a conflict with a partner, if we understand ourselves and if we can tap into our body as to what am I feeling at this point in time, uh, maybe it's anger that's coming up because the there is a disagreement about something, then it's about understanding that emotion uh, and being able to express it and to say, hey, at this point in time, I am feeling angry, you know, stating it and then taking a pause. Because once you've taken a pause, 
you go and regulate yourselves and i teach my clients on how to regulate those emotions and then come back and let your partner know i'm going to take a break for 5 minutes in order to regulate the anger that's emerging within me and i'll be back in 5 minutes because this way the the partner does not feel that you've abandoned them and that you are disrespecting but they also understand that yes they've gone to regulate and they'll be back within those 5 minutes so it is really important so our uh, intimacy and our personal development they work hand in hand with each other yeah so it sounds like emotional intimacy kind of um not really forces but kind of urges you to have some empathy and grow in that aspect as well which definitely ties into personal development um so the next thing i was really curious to know is what is it like to go from having an intimate relationship with someone that you thought you'd spend the rest of your life with someone that you're married to someone that you thought would be your partner for the rest of your life to not having one at all and at the same time with the cultural stigma half your friends and family frown upon your decision what it could you bring us through that um experience um an interesting question and i think i've partly kind of um explained this a little earlier as well because when we have when a relationship gets terminated it could be because of three reasons either you are terminating it or your partner is terminating it or there is a mutual con- consent between the two of you irrespective of the scenario a person goes through various state i mean a person goes through a lot of turmoil there is emotional turmoil for sure um you are on that roller coaster of emotions where one minute you are feeling relief that it's all over on the other hand you find yourself spiraling you know there's intense emotions of sadness of grief of um of anger there's denial you are in that grief cycle you're caught in that cycle um if if termination or divorce is stigmatized then it comes with a lot of social stigma as well where you are judged for your relationship where you're completely isolated people are torn between adhering to the social expectations and your decision and therefore because not everyone has the courage to stand up with you most of your relatives and loved ones and friends kind of isolate you and sometimes you might even have common friends they might also isolate you as well this further leads into uh, identity crisis because all of a sudden you were known with being someone's someone's partner and you were mrs so and so and then you go into your maiden name and the maiden name even though it's familiar it's distant because and all of a sudden you find yourself being on this shaky ground where on the one hand um you know there is everything is familiar and yet it is unfamiliar because there is a complete turmoil that's taking place in your life whether it is in terms of legal proceedings or whether it is in terms of your social network or whether it is in terms of the impact it will have on your children uh, because children do get affected both emotionally and psychologically when the parents are getting separated or when they're getting divorced so then there is idea of rebuilding yourself or you know on uh, uh, on having a different set of social connections or your financial footing and there are there's a lot that a person goes through when the relationship terminates Yeah and with the treatment that one gets from family friends society for going through divorce how should they respond to it interesting question <laughs> because um it is important that when you are deciding to go through a divorce there are certain things that you need to be really mindful of and the things that i would recommend here is to ensure that you have a support system with you so you do have a therapist with you or a coach with you a counselor psychologist whoever that you feel comfortable with you have to work with them beforehand that you're going through a divorce and this is what you're likely to face because that person not only holds your hand through this journey but they can also be mirrors to you where instead of colluding with you and with your story and all the stories that you might be making up the blame game that you might be involved in they can actually be a neutral party 
where in they can show the mirror to you and hold you accountable and for you to take responsibility for your role in the relationship as well so i support uh, i definitely believe in having a support system and at the same time it is equally important that during this time that you set your boundaries very very important because there will be negativity all around you not only are you feeling negativity within yourself but at the same time there's negativity around you especially if there is stigma involved so you are setting those boundaries and coming terms and at the same time be, being grateful acknowledging that people can have different views so uh, being patient with yourself expressing your gratitude it, i know at that point in time it's very difficult to express gratitude however being mindful that you know wherever you are at this point in time is for the very best of what is likely to come because currently you're stepping out of your comfort zone and you don't know what life holds out for you so being patient with even the small wins the small joys that you have you know even getting out of your bed acknowledging that fact that today i got out of bed you know so being patient and compassionate with yourself and the way you speak to yourself because negative self talk can be rampant at this point in time so being mindful of your thoughts that and giving yourself that positive reinforcement uh, about the fact that you know there is something better likely to come out of this Yeah that's a great sentiment to have and it's also a kind of like if these other people surrounding you that are meant to be your loved ones and they're treating you this way you've probably got to remind yourself that um that's not how you should be treated at all and perhaps it's not worth having them take up space or time in your life as well um and I'm sure that doesn't make the the process any easier um but it's probably something that will help get um them through it and you mentioned previously that seeking help through this um this process is very important so what advice would you have for finding the right person to speak to about this um it is really an interesting question and um not only i i feel not only is there a stigma around divorce there is a lot of stigma around having therapy as well uh because in certain cultures uh people believe that you are either um uh, intellectually challenged that you are seeking the support um however it is important to have such a support uh and i'll tell you through my own experience when i went through my divorce i did not want anyone to know that i was planning to seek a uh, seek the support of a therapist because it felt as though people would call me mad because that's generally what it is oh she must be mad so that's why she's going there's something wrong with her whereas um and and i i still remember the first time i went to see a therapist i parked my car three lanes down where the office was because i didn't want even though nobody knew me and yet there was such a lot of stigma around it and there was this inner critic within me telling me hey you're not doing the right thing by society by going and seeing a therapist uh so when you ask me a question on what are the things that they must see, seek in order to seek a therapist uh generally people go to uh uh a gp in order to get a referral i think in australia we get the opportunity to see a psychologist we get i think about six sessions for free from the feedback that i have got from my own clients they feel that since i assist professional women of color and they approach me only because they feel that when they go and see a psychologist who may not be from our own culture they struggle to explain their cultural nuances to them and it takes almost six sessions just explaining those nuances because it's so difficult for the other person though they come with a good intention however it's difficult to explain something so when my clients come to me people women of color they already know that when they are mentioning a line i instantly get it because i am from that same culture so uh, that makes a lot of difference so if you can seek out a uh, uh, coach a therapist from your own culture it definitely helps 
uh, and at the same time being brave enough and courageous enough that the other person, the therapist, um, can support you therapeutically. And therefore, it's a good idea to approach and not to listen to your loved ones, family, and not um, get caught up in the social uh, norms of not seeing a therapist, but actually going ahead and stepping out of your comfort zone to see one. So on the other hand, for people who know someone going through divorce and are living in this within a culture with this stigma, um, what should or shouldn't they say to their friend or family going through divorce? Such an interesting question, Murray. Um, I'll begin with uh, what you can say to a person who's going through a divorce. So it's about empathizing with them, you know, showing your concern to them. So you can make statements like, I'm here for you. Uh, I'm here to listen to you without any judgment. Um, how are you feeling today? Do you need support or assistance with your children? Or do you need any assistance or any other chores? Uh, I care about you. I'm concerned about you. I can't imagine the pain that you might be experiencing at this point in time. So being really empathetic uh, and understanding. On the other hand, uh, you must avoid statements like this, which I hear very, very commonly, where people go on to judging them, you know, providing them unsolicited advice and so on and so forth. And I've heard these and I've heard not only myself, but I've heard these from my clients as well. And they will go, um, I never liked your spouse anyway. So good that he's gone. Um, you deserve someone better. Uh, things like, um, you will get over this very soon. Then uh, my friend got over this very quickly. What's wrong with you? Why can't you get over it? Why are you always feeling so sad? There is nothing to feel sad about it. You know, people are also using these cliches like um, everything happens for a reason. Uh, time will heal everything for you. You know, statements like this. Uh, and even some pe people go on to making statements and by providing this um, support, like I'll be there for you 24-7. You know, we cannot be there. So things like that, uh, such statements should definitely be avoided. Yeah, that's a really good breakdown of that. Thank you for bringing us, bringing us through that. Um, lastly, do you have any more advice for those who might be going through divorce while facing cultural stigma? Um, I would suggest that this is a time, as I mentioned earlier, that a person is going through a lot of emotional distress. Um, however, it is important to remember that anything that happens in our life, there is a reason behind it. And to see divorce not as a failure, but actually as a sign of reclamation. That's how I see it. Uh, and it's a sign of reclamation because there are certain women who are the first ones who have applied for a divorce in many, many generations uh, because of the stigma attached. And when you are one of those women, then you are one of one in your lineage who is standing up to say no more. No more to this disrespect. No more to being in toxic relationships. No more to... Um, to be sacrificing oneself all the time for the others. So instead of seeing it as a failure, I think it's also a sign of success because it can lead to a lot of transformation within yourself. Absolutely. I can imagine that that change in perspective would really, really help um, with going through with it. So thank you so much for breaking that all down for us. Um, it is a very difficult, complex topic to talk about and not a lot of people can really put it into words, but you did it so well with us on this episode. Um, now we're moving on to the practice slash habit section. And I'd love for you to run us through some good daily habits to practice when it comes to um, managing emotional distress in light of um, the ending of an intimate relationship. Um, so what is a habit that you'd recommend practicing? 
Um, I would say that we need to be having a holistic approach in the practices that we follow. So we are looking after our body, mind and soul. And so doing activities which take into consideration all the three. So when it comes to our body, making sure that you're spending time in nature to refresh yourself and to reju rejuvenate yourself. Um, eating, at that point in time, people don't feel like eating. But making sure that you are taking in a nutritional diet, you're sleeping well. Um, uh, then at the same time, seeking support from a therapist, as I said, or a coach. Also ensuring that you are engaging yourself into certain hobbies, you know, hobbies that you left long time ago or the ones that you always wanted to do, but because of the constraints of the relationship, you could engage in them. So get into some hobbies so that you are able to uh, break out of your isolation and make new friends. So when you're going to these hobbies, because people coming there are also also like those hobbies. So you are able to develop new social connections. Journaling is a very therapeutic way, you know, where you can uh, validate your feelings yourself and, you know, express your emotions. I am a firm believer in meditation because meditation can help you to emotionally regulate yourself and also reduce your stress. Um, I also... Um, though this may be out of, I also uh, believe in having a pet, whether it's a dog or it's a, it's a cat or whatever pet that you like, because they can be very therapeutic in ensuring that you get, you're surrounded by that unconditional love. Saying affirmations, you know, having certain affirmations like I am enough, I am loved, I am lovable, I accept me, any of those affirmations, you know, make a list down and repeat them say them in the morning or in the off, at night uh, because they can rewire your mind and bring in a positive outlook. Similarly, the other thing that I also did was getting involved in volunteering activities. You know, go because there is, and I am, con uh, I might be uh, challenging some people here because I feel that at the time we are going through divorce, we become very narcissistic. It's all about me, 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 me. You know, whereas going out and helping other people and seeing that there are people out there who are in worse situations than you are. Uh, and so going and acknowledging that and therefore feeling blessed and being grateful for everything that you have. Uh, so acknowledging yourself, maintaining a, a gratitude journal, not only to express gratitude to the others, but also gratitude to yourself that you went and volunteered today or, you know, being really grateful for every little thing that you do yourself. The other thing that I would say, which is a little difficult, but which comes with time, is about forgiveness. Forgiving yourself for being in that relationship, if it was a toxic one. Forgiving yourself that you could not recognize those red flags. And forgiving um, forgiving the other person. And forgiving them, Not you're not forgiving the wrongs that they have done to you, but forgiving them so that you can move forward for your own good, for your own growth, for your own personal development and for your own, you know, for your own renewed sense of self. Yeah, that is really well said, Monica. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Now moving on to the open mic section and this is your opportunity to talk about anything that you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be related to the topic, but if you want it to be related to the topic, feel free to go ahead with that. So the floor is yours. Take it away. Um, I would say that I will come back to the main topic about divorce, that divorce does fall, follow certain stages. You know, initially, uh, there is that contemplation stage where you are thinking about, oh, something's not right in my relationship. Should I stay in this relationship or should I leave this relationship? And there are some people who are stuck in that stage for a lifetime because of the stigma attached. Um, then the it moves on to the next stage where you decide that, yes, there's a last straw, something's happened, either there's infidelity or something, and you decide to go ahead with the divorce. Um, then there is the legal procedure. There is a lot of pressure from family to reconcile, not to go ahead with divorce. I am 
I am stating these stages to come to the idea that it is better sometimes to leave a toxic relationship rather than to remain stuck in such a relationship. Some people in our cultures stay in such relationships, such toxic relationships because of their children, because of the impact divorce will have uh, on a child. And people are also fearful of change, fearful of the unknown. So they don't want to step and they don't feel that they have the courage to, uh, to face society because you are challenging social norms in order to step out of such culture, in order to step out of the societal expectation, the cultural traditions, you are dismantling the family structure. Uh, those are all fears. They are just fears because, uh, because there is life after divorce. And that's what I'm trying to normalize through my personal experience and through my expertise that there is life after divorce and that we all have the courage deeply buried within us and we can shine through even after our divorce. Absolutely. That is really well put. Um, thank you so much, Monica, for sharing that with us today. Um, it was a really insightful discussion and I hope that our listeners have learned a thing or two about this process. Um, if our listeners want to find out more about you and your work and what you do, where can they go? They can either connect with me on LinkedIn or on Facebook. Uh, and at the same time, I do have a website, Monica Kalra Coaching. Uh, they can email me at monikakalracoaching at gmail.com. Uh, I also have two books on uh, Amazon. I'd love them to read. One of them is called How Do You Know He's the One, which talks about red flags and also the loving traits. The other one is How to Heal from a Toxic Relationship. Both of these are available on Amazon. So get in touch, read these books, and then spread the word around that there is up around. Thank you. Amazing. We'll leave those in the show notes. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We hope you learned about the effects of cultural stigma on the post-divorce journey with Monica's guidance and we'll catch you in the next episode. You've been listening to the Self-Improvement Atlas, the Personal Science Insights Podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. For more episodes like this from 10 different life management perspectives, search LMSL on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts so you can get updated on everything we have to offer. We have a wide range of topics readily available for you to check out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it and subscribing to our channel as it helps us grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at pe.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Marie Stella. Thanks for tuning in.